Monday night and Tuesday are Simchat Torah. I think it is time to do a quick review, not of the Torah itself, but of its most important human character. We all know that Moses is the central figure in the Torah, but we don't always have a good sense of his life and the challenges of his life. And sometimes understanding the challenges of great figures helps us meet our own challenges. So give me a moment to highlight a few of the things Moses had to endure. First of all, do you know how you know someone important is coming in the Torah? They get a lot of begats. This one begat, that one begat, that one begat, that one begat Abraham. Moses gets no begats. He gets begot. He is born. But for the first six chapters of the book of Exodus, we don't even know his parents' names. It's not like the Torah is saying, here comes this amazing person. It doesn't even mention his parents' name. Then he is born under a sign of death, right? Since all the firstborn are supposed to, since all the boys, rather, the males are supposed to be cast into the Nile, but he gets saved. He grows up in Pharaoh's palace, separate from his family. What's the first thing he sees? The suffering of the Israelites. Now I'm going to develop a theme. So he sees an Egyptian taskmaster hitting an Israelite slave, and so he strikes down the taskmaster. Then he finds out that people know about it. So who must have told on him? There was only one person left, the Israelite slave, which means that the first person who betrays Moses is another Israelite, and he has to run away. So he runs away to Midian. He runs away to Midian. While he's in Midian, God calls on him at the burning bush and says, go to Pharaoh. And what does Moses say? No, thank you. I don't want to. I don't talk right to send somebody else. So Moses is forced into a mission he doesn't want. He says literally, shlach na biyad tishlach, which almost doesn't make any sense. But translated loosely, it means send anybody except me. And God says to him, this is not an optional assignment. You're going. So he goes to Pharaoh. When he goes to Pharaoh, Pharaoh obviously opposes him. And the Israelites are not so crazy about his mission either because They've been oppressed, they're afraid of Egypt, they don't want trouble. But eventually, eventually, there is this exodus and Moses somehow shepherds them across the sea. And when they get there, what's the first thing the Israelites say? We wanna go back to Egypt. It's hot, it's not pleasant, we don't have enough food. So keep that in mind too the attitude of the Israelites towards Moses, who didn't want the job in the first place. Then he gets betrayed by everyone. His brother Aaron, whom he's close to, betrays him by building the golden calf, right? It's Aaron that helps build the golden calf. And then do you remember who gossips about him? His sister Miriam. So he's betrayed by his brother Aaron, by his sister Miriam, the Israelites, like every, every, every like Monday and Thursday, they say, look, there's not a lot going on in the desert. Let's betray Moses. They betray him with Korach's rebellion. They betray him with the meat. They're constantly saying, why don't we go back to Egypt? They betray him, obviously, with the golden calf, on and on. And then finally, finally, they get to the end of the journey. And what does God say? You die here. You don't get to go into the land. And it's the final betrayal. Now, if I ask you, why doesn't Moses get to go into the land of Israel? You will say, having gone to either Sinai Akiba or Hebrew school, because he hit a rock. If I said to you, in 40 years of leading a people through the wilderness, the worst thing the man did was to hit a rock, you would say, this is ridiculous. Now, without going into the question of what exactly that sin was, still, Moses has done so much 
and he didn't want the job in the first place, and now he doesn't get to go into Israel. In the Torah itself, Moses makes a very slight plea, can't I please go? God says, no, that's the end of it. But the rabbis who love Moses and who feel for him wove this beautiful legend about what really happened when Moses was denied entry into the land of Israel. There is an entire small book of Midrash called Midrash Petirat Moshe, the Midrash of the death of Moses. I'm not going to give you the whole book, don't worry. But this is the essence of it. When Moses hears that he can't go into the land, he draws a small circle in the ground and stands inside the circle and says, I'm not leaving the circle until you tell me I can go. It's like a child, right? And God says, Moses. <laughs> The circle is like, that's not going to force my hand, right? You're not going to get to go into the land of Israel. So then Moses starts to pray and to cry. And Moses' prayers reach all the way to the heavens. So God tells the angels, lock all the gates of heaven so that I don't have to listen to Moses' prayer. And then finally, after lots of other backs and forths, Finally, Moses looks up at the heavens and he says, Rabbono Shalom, dear God, don't you remember? This is me. This is Moses. Remember how you took me when I was little more than a child and you said, we will go to Pharaoh and we will work signs and wonders and we did it. And we will liberate this people. And together we liberated them. And don't you remember how I was up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights with you? And even though down below the children of Israel were building the golden calf, and even though they were neglecting your commandments, still we gave them another set of commandments and we led them through the desert. This is me. How could you do this to me? I don't need to live in Israel, but just let me walk in the land. Let me feel the grass. Let me smell the earth. And finally, finally, God speaks back to Moses. And he says, Moses, you're a human being. And all human beings die. But I myself will attend to your burial. At that moment, say the rabbis, Moses lay down. And he folded his arms across his chest. And then the Midrash ends as follows. It says, and God came down from the highest heavens to take the soul of his servant Moses. And God took the soul of his servant Moses with a kiss. And God wept. I tell you this story because so often we speak about the great characters of the Jewish tradition as if they're just inhuman figures, but there is such pathos, such beauty, and such power to the way our tradition thinks about these great figures and to what they mean and to how they express their deepest heart and the struggle that Moses had to go through and those of us who go through struggles in this world, especially if you're trying to accomplish something great, sometimes we assume that for people before us, it was frictionless and easy, but it's not true. And what is Moses' reward for the betrayals and the struggles and the fighting? At the end of the Torah, it says, Moses saw God panim el panim, face to face. So what do you get to do if you struggle and you try and you build, even though there will be failures along the way? You get to see others and perhaps in some way even God, panim el panim, face to face. And that intimacy and that closeness and that love was Moses' reward and God willing is ours. And maybe that, in the end, is why we don't call Moses Moses in our tradition. We call Moses Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher, because from him there is so much to learn. Shabbat Shalom and Chag Sameach. <laughs>